All right, everyone. This is Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. My name is Travis Steffens, and I'm here to bring you uh, the Virginia Zoo in Norfolk. And we're going to meet some remarkable reptiles. We're going to uncover the traits that make reptiles such a unique group within the animal kingdom. And by the end of today's hangout, we'll have a better understanding of the adaptations that our scaly little friends use to survive. So I'm going to introduce Steph and uh, Stephanie and Jess, who are here now. Let me just uh, say hello to y'all. Hello. Hello. Great. Um, I didn't hear you, but uh, let's try it again. Ready? I mean, everyone say hi. Hi. Hello. hi. hi. And okay, then wonderful. Wonderful. Great. And then just want to make sure I hear uh, uh, Jess and Stephanie. Can I? Can you guys hear us? We can hear you. Can you hear us? Okay, I don't hear you for some reason. Oh, I hear you now. Great. Wonderful. You're. You're live and ready to go. Thanks so much. Okay. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for joining us here today at the Virginia Zoo. We are going to talk about some remarkable reptiles. We have four different reptiles that we brought to meet you today. We're going to talk a little bit about what makes a reptile a reptile. So there are a few things that all reptiles have in common. They all have scales. They lay eggs and they are usually cold blooded. So cold blooded means that they cannot keep their own bodies warm. So in the winter time, when it gets cold, they can't just put on a sweater. They have to use the sun uh, to keep themselves warm and then they have to go in the shade to cool themselves down. So all reptiles have these three traits in common, but within even the entire group of reptiles, they all have very, very special and unique adaptations that make them different from each other. So we're going to talk a little bit about how our reptiles are specially adapted to live in their environments and how even though they're all in the reptile family, they do have their own special and features that are super duper cool. So Stephanie is going to present our first animal friend and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna let her take over. All right, hi guys. This is my friend Regan and she's just called an Argentine tegu. So she is actually from South America now, tegus are a type of lizard. They're a larger type of lizard because lizards actually come in all different shapes and sizes, and they all have different things that make them unique. Now, I'm not sure if you guys can really see her tongue or not. I can also bring her closer. Um, so she actually has a forked tongue, if she sticks out. There we go. <laughs> um, so she actually can sense and smell the environment around her by using that forked tongue. So something really cool with that is she can actually tell directions of where her prey is. So the animals that she is going to be looking to eat, she might go after small mice, she might go after other smaller animals, and they also will also sometimes eat eggs. But by sticking her tongue out, she can tell if a mouse is going to be on her left or on her right. So she'll actually be able to find those. She also has some other really cool adaptations. She has some claws on her. And that is because where she lives, she is going to be doing a bit of digging. So she's going to be digging through the ground. She's going to be using those claws for protection. And she's going to kind of climb with them as well. Something that other lizards have, there are a couple different types of lizards that actually have sticky feet. And those are those lizards that can climb walls and other surfaces. So those animals have those sticky pads on their feet instead of the claws that they use to kind of scramble and run around. She also has a very long tail. I'm not sure if you can see the tail. Um, but her big long tail is also something she's going to use to protect herself. She can whip her tail and it's gonna be typically the kind of length of her body. Some of our other lizards do use their tail to store some fat or store water in it. So they can actually use their tail kind of like a pantry or a refrigerator. And their tail is gonna help them to survive out in the wild. Now lizards are kind of unique because they do have little ear holes. So they don't have ears on the outside of their head. When Regan has her head turned here on the side, right behind her eyes, in this general area um, is where her ear holes are so she can actually hear pretty well she also does have a good sense of vision so she's able to kind of see her surroundings and find out where everything is so she can see well she can hear well and that helps her to kind of find her prey it also helps her to survive in her environment now one thing with these tegus argentine tegus can survive in a lot of different environments and something that's actually happened with them is that they are an invasive species in Florida because when people buy tegus, they're a little tiny animal and they think they're really, really cute. And then they get Regan size or larger. And unfortunately, some people will let them out in their backyards. 
and just kind of leave their tegu out in the yard and then not bring it back in the house. So the tegus are actually taking over a lot in areas of Florida because they have no natural predators. They can survive in lots of environments and they can eat pretty much anything. So they're an omnivore is our big word for that. They eat fruits, they eat veggies, and they can also eat meat as well. So all those different things help them to survive in any type of environment really where it's nice and warm. And so they can survive down in Florida. So they're an invasive species, which is what we want to talk about is that you don't want to just get a pet without doing a lot of research, make sure you know how to take care of them. And you never want to let them go randomly out into the wild without taking to a rescue or somewhere else. So our next friend is another type of reptile because we said we are talking about reptiles. So we've got some different characteristics that we just talked about our lizard friend. So we're going to be bringing in another animal for you guys to meet. All right, guys. So our next animal ambassador is a pancake tortoise, and his name is Flapjack. So Flapjack here is found in Africa, specifically in the Kenya area. He likes to live in areas that are very, very dry. Usually it's very rocky and hilly, not a lot of plants and trees because he's got this really, really awesome coloring that he uses to help blend in with those environments. And when an animal blends in with their environment, we call that camouflage. So his camouflage is going to be his first line of defense from anybody who would try to eat him because an animal that is trying to eat him is not a friend that he wants to make. And then his second line of defense is actually his speed. Yes, I said speed. He is a tortoise, but he is actually the fastest species of tortoise. Pancake tortoises have this very, very flat, streamlined aerodynamic shell, like a race car. And he is able to run very, very quickly for tortoise and wedge himself underneath rocks. His shell is also very thin and flexible. So he's able to squeeze himself into places that he wouldn't be able to if he had a really big shell like most tortoises do. So we are talking about reptiles and what a lot of people don't think about is that tortoises do have scales just like other reptiles. The difference is their scales are really, really rough and they are tons of different sizes. So they look kind of interesting. Usually they're all over their feet and their face and their legs and their tail, but they also have that shell that makes them different from all other reptile species. So pancake tortoises have that very thin shell. The top part is called a carapace and the bottom part is called a plastron. So the plastron on pancake tortoises is so thin that I can actually feel him breathing whenever he takes a really deep breath and he goes, <sighs> I'm so tired. I want to go home and go to bed. Like I know some of us are probably thinking because we're at school. He takes that really deep breath and I can actually feel him breathing, which is even unique among other turtle and tortoise species because most turtles and tortoises use their shell for protection. His shell is not very good protection because it's so thin, but at least it looks really cool. And that's pretty much all he cares about. So he is also an omnivore. Remember, we learned that that means that they eat plants and meat. The meat that he eats is mostly bugs. I'm sure that we all love to eat bugs for breakfast, but he eats those bugs up. Oh, he's probably gonna go to the bathroom soon. I'm sorry if that happens. He is a tortoise, so they tend to go to the bathroom a lot. Um, I, I know that because I can feel him ready himself to go to the bathroom through his shell. So even among reptiles, turtles and tortoises are very, very unique. Yep, there he goes. Very, very unique. They've got that shell. Um, there's different kinds of turtles. So tortoises are a kind of turtle. Uh, they live on land. Most of them cannot swim. Most of them uh, tend to be herbivores, so they eat only plants. However, some tortoises, like our pancake tortoise, will also eat bugs when they have the opportunity. He does look a little turtle-like but he is in fact a tortoise. So it's not always a good idea to just look at an animal and be like, oh, that's definitely a turtle. I see it walking across the road and I'm just gonna throw it back into the pond. We don't tend to want to do that because you may have a tortoise and you just don't know it and tortoises can't swim. But also because if you see any animal in their natural habitat, usually it's not a good idea to go and try to pick them up and move them. Unless, this is the only exception, 
you see a turtle in the middle of the road and it is safe to move it, then you can pick up that turtle very carefully, just like I've got him right now, and move him across the road in the direction he was already going. So turtles and tortoises, one other adaptation that they have that helps them is they have a great sense of direction. So when they are heading somewhere, they make a beeline right for wherever they wanna go and they get there as fast as they can. So if you have a turtle or a tortoise and you see them in the middle of the road and they're facing this way and you pick them up and you go to move them over here, they're just gonna try to cross the road again because they're trying to get to that spot they were aiming for. So if we ever try to move them, we wanna make sure we put them in the direction they were already going. That's if it's safe. And also if it's not an alligator snapping turtle, please don't try to move those. So we've got two more animals for you to meet. And Stephanie is going to bring out our next animal friend. Blackjack made a little bit of a mess, so I'm gonna clean that up while she's doing that. All right guys, so this is a friend of mine. His name is Kirk. Um, and he looks like one animal, but is actually a different type of animal. So he looks like he's a snake. He has a long body like a snake, but it's actually a lizard, just like our friend Regan was. So our legless lizard, what makes him a lizard is that he does have eyelids. So I'm gonna move him a little bit closer. Um, so he has eyelids over his eyes. So you can actually see his eyelids. He does have holes for ears on the side of his head. And something else cool that he has is he actually has what's called a free-floating hip bone. So even though he doesn't have any legs on his body at all, he does have the remnants of that. So he does have hip, uh, hip bone in there as well as some remnants of what where his legs would be. So those are all things that make him a lizard versus a snake. So even though he has a lizard body he, or a snake body, he has a lizard shape or a snake shape, not a lizard shape, he is actually a lizard. So unfortunately, something that happens is people think these are snakes. So a lot of times they end up getting killed because people are afraid of snakes, but they all really have an important job. Our lizard friend here, you might see him roll around a little bit. That's just because he is letting me know he wants to sit down or hang out in a different spot. So he might roll a little. That's one of his forms of defense. So he can roll to get away from predators. He can really move pretty quickly. Most lizards are not going to move super fast, but these guys can actually slither through the ground and move really, really quickly. They are called legless lizards, and they're also called glass lizards as well. So we're going to let him kind of calm down here for a second. He's just rolling away. Um, they do use their camouflage. If you can kind of see his colors, that kind of green and brown colors that he has, he's going to use that to kind of hang out in the ground and stay along the ground. He's going to move a lot like a snake, but he's going to eat very differently than a snake. A legless lizard is going to have a different type of jaw than a snake. They can't move their jaw and kind of open it as wide as a snake can. So what he can do is eat small insects. So he's mostly going to eat crickets and other little insects like worms or maybe some grasshoppers or different things like that. So those are all in different things that he's going to eat. Now, you might notice he, if he sticks his tongue out a little bit, he does not have a forked tongue like Regan does. He actually has more of a wider tongue. Now, not all lizards... Um, are going to be able to use their tongue to smell, but the majority of them will actually have some sense of smell in their tongue. So those are all different things about him. So they are also, I said that he's a legless lizard. They're also called a glass lizard because they have this really long tail. And one of their forms of defense is that he is going to be able to break off the tip of his tail or shatter the tip of his tail. And what's going to happen is predators are going to be looking for that and they're going to follow his tail, which might maybe still be wiggling. And then he's going to be able to slither away in the grass. So he's actually going to be able to get away by breaking the tip of his tail off. So the tip of his tail might grow back a little bit, but it's not going to grow back as quite as long as the rest of him. Now, the majority of his body is actually body. And then the end tip right here, this is where his tail is. So he's got mostly body and then he has tail at the rest of it. Now, these guys are found in Europe. Um, so they are mostly going to be in brushlands and different types of grasses, and they are going to use those scales to kind of keep themselves protected. They're also going to protect themselves by being able to whip their tail. And then another adaptation that they have is the fact that they look like a snake. 
because most animals, if they see something coming, they're going to be more afraid if it's a snake, but then he's going to show off that he's a lizard. So a lot of things are not going to go after him. He's a little protected because people or other animals might think he's a snake and they're going to kind of stay away instead of trying to eat him. So I think we do have our next animal getting ready here. So we saw our lizard Regan, who was our big tegu. And now we had another type of lizard here and that looks like a snake. And our next animal you're going to meet is actually a snake. So this is Lernin. Lernin is a common boa. Common boas are snakes. They are true snakes. They're not just pretending to be snakes the way that Kirk, our legless lizard, was. So snakes are very unique in the reptile world for a lot of reasons. They are still reptiles. They still lay eggs. They have scales. They're ectothermic or cold-blooded. But he also likes to try to go up my shirt sleeve. Snakes smell with their tongues exclusively, only with their tongues. There's no snake that does not smell with its tongue, I think. If there's an exception out there, I don't know it. So I'm gonna say most, if not all. Another thing is we've got these real neat things on the side of our heads called ears that help us to hear. Snakes do not have ears. Even our two lizards who had holes in the side of their head, those were their ears. Snakes have no ears at all. The way that they hear sound is through their jawbone. So they feel vibrations or a hum in the ground or in the air and that vibration or hum travels up their jawbone into their brain. And that's how they hear, for lack of a better word. Last but not least, snakes do not have eyelids. If you tried to have a staring contest with learning, you would lose every single time, unless you also don't have eyelids. They have a clear scale that sits over their eye and that helps protect it in the way that our eyelids do. So when a snake sheds its skin, you can actually see that scale because it pops off their eye a little bit and it gets really, really cloudy and we call that opaque. So when a snake goes opaque in its eyes, that's usually the first sign that they're about to shed their skin, which is pretty cool. Last but not least, Stephanie, do you wanna grab that skull for me? Snakes have got a really, really cool skull. So we've got a reticulated python skull here and this skull, sort of shows how a snake's jaw can separate because a snake swallows its food whole. Remember, they don't have any grabby hands to help get their food into their mouth. So what happens is they open up their mouth as wide as it can go, and then this part of their jaw actually pops off, it unhinges, and then, last step, the middle part right here actually separates out even further. If you could open your jaw as big as a snake could, proportionally, you would be able to swallow an entire watermelon. So snakes are pretty, pretty good at what they do. Now, Magnum here, the biggest thing he can eat is about as big as the largest part of his body, which is right here. So that's gonna be something like a rodent, like a rat. And that's really, really important because we have snakes right here in Virginia you have snakes where you are in California or Quebec, and those snakes actually help keep your rodent population down. So if you have mice or rats in your house, goodness forbid, you actually want to have more snakes around because those snakes help keep that population in check so that they don't eat up all your cereal when you're not looking. So if you see a snake in your backyard, I know a lot of us tend to be a little uncertain around snakes, that's okay, but we do want to respect them and know that they're doing a really, really important job and we want to leave them alone so they can keep doing that really, really important job because I really like cereal and I do not like rats in my cereal. So that being said, I am going to go ahead and put learning away and Stephanie's going to close us out. All right, so we met four different animals that are all reptiles, but all of those four animals, even though they are different, all have three main things in common. So one of those things they have in common is they all lay eggs. Some of those that lay eggs, they're going to bury their eggs in the dirt, and those are going to hatch out from there. Well, some of them actually keep their eggs inside of them and give live birth. We do have some types of lizards and snakes that do that as well. The other thing that they have in common is they all had scales. So that's another thing that makes them reptiles is they all have scales covering their body. The last thing that they all have is that they are all called ectoderms.
ectothermic, which means that they are cold blooded. So that means that they need to go somewhere warm if they have to warm up or they have to stay in a warm environment or to kind of get together to keep themselves warm. So they can't get themselves warm without being in the sunshine. So even though all of them are different, they all have those three things in common. Something else that's really important that we learned today is that they all have different adaptations. So even though all those different animals are different, they have, or are a little bit in the reptile group, they're all different with their adaptations that allow them to help survive in the environment they're in. So they might have something like claws, or they might have the forked tongue that they can smell with. So those are all different adaptations that they have. The other thing we did learn is how we can help them in their own environment. We learned what we can do with tortoises. If we see tortoises or turtles out there, that snakes are really important for us, and that our lizard friends do eat lots of different things. So they have all different varieties of prey that they will go after. So now that's all of our animal presentation that we have. So we are going to turn it back over to you guys to see if you have any questions for us, and then we'll be able to answer them for you. So we hope you enjoyed meeting our animals and seeing a little bit about what we do here at the Virginia Zoo. Wonderful. Thanks, Jess and Stephanie. That was incredible. Um, let's do at least one question from every class. Um, how about uh, we start with uh, just the order I have here. Um, Mrs. Edwards, does, uh, is, does your class have a question you'd like to ask to the, uh, to the Norfolk, to the Virginia Zoo here? Yes, they do. Oh, wonderful. Uh, do you, how often do you all have to feed the snakes? Did you oh, hear that? You feed them? How often? Yes. So it depends on the size of the snake. Stephanie is actually going to probably be able to give you a more specific answer than I could. So Lernan, our big boa that you guys met, he eats about every three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so because he is a larger snake, he doesn't need to eat as often because he has often was going to eat something larger. Um, some of our smaller snakes, as they're growing, eat once a week. So they'll actually eat a small mouse as they're growing about once a week. And then as they get a little bit larger, then they are going to eat maybe twice a month, so maybe every two weeks. And then something else, um, the bigger, big, huge snakes, like our reticulated python that we saw that skull for, they eat maybe once a month, but some of those animals can go several months in the wild without eating. So we keep our snakes very well fed here, but if it's a snake out in the wild, they don't have to usually eat as often. Wonderful. Wonderful, that's fantastic. Um, Mrs. Reading, did you, uh, your class have a, have a question? Yes, we do, okay. Right. Do you help any endangered species? We help a lot of endangered species, actually. Um, reptiles, any endangered reptiles? At the zoo we do. We do have, so I don't know if we presented any today that were endangered, but actually in our department, we do have a wood turtle named Woody, and her species is endangered, mostly due to habitat loss. We also have what's called our species survival plan here at the Virginia Zoo. And one reptile that is part of our species survival plan is the bog turtle, which is another turtle species. And they are actually critically endangered because they live in one very specific habitat um, that is slowly disappearing. So we actually help by encouraging our animals to breed with each other, helping them have a happy environment to live in so that they succeed. And eventually we work with other zoos and other AZA accredited institutions to help those populations in their natural habitat. The bond turtle, we actually had one before. We did. We did. We had one before. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, because we are going to try to do some things to help our friend here wants to try to get involved to help some animals who are endangered. Oh, that's awesome. So there's actually a lot you can just do in your backyard. If you make sure that your backyard is clean, make sure that you are planting plants that are specifically helpful to whatever species you're wanting to help. You can go online with a parent or another adult and do some research. Research is always the first step in helping any animal species that is endangered. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, what about uh, Mrs. Patterson's class? Do you have a question for the team here? Yes, we do. Come on, Katie. Have you ever got bitten by a snake? I've never been bitten by any of our snakes. Um, that doesn't say that it doesn't happen, 
but usually snakes only bite when they are scared and we do our best not to scare them. Yeah. And I've also never been bitten by a snake and my job is to condition all of our snakes for programs so yeah. that they can meet people. Um, we just make sure that we don't put them in a situation they feel like they're going to be scared. And like I said, they are also very well fed. Um, so we also make sure, like we were switching off animals, in between each of those animals we handled, we washed our hands and used some hand sanitizer so that we didn't smell like another animal as well. Mm -hmm. So a snake out in the wild is typically only going to bite if you maybe step on it or if you disturbed its habitat or if you if are making it feel like it feels like it needs to protect itself. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, if you just leave them be, they're going to kind of swarm off on their own and they're going to go their own direction. Cool. Thank you. Um, what about Mrs. DeShane's class? Do you have a question? Uh, Hello. Yeah. There? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Where did you get these animals from? Different places. Yeah. Um, so as a zoo, we do not take animals from their natural habitat, obviously. Uh, that is something that we are trying to do the opposite of nowadays. A lot of our animals come from other zoos. I'm not sure if we know specifically off the top of our heads where all of them came from Regan that we presented. Regan, I think, was a rescue. So some of our larger reptiles, especially, we do get from animal shelters or from private owners who no longer can take care of them or have abandoned them just because we don't want to encourage people to let them go in places like the Everglades. Um, and we do our best to make sure we can help where we can. Great, thank you. Um, Mrs. Saldivar, does your class have a question? Was it Hello. us? Yeah, Saldivar, Hello? did you have a question? Oh, yes, we do, sorry. We kind of, I don't know, if, right here. I don't know if you can see us or not. We kind of lost the connection on this side. Um, we don't see you right now, but uh, we do hear you. Okay, go for it. How did you become a zookeeper? Oh, you lost a what, college? what college did you go to? Oh, great question. So, okay, sit down, friends. We'll see. Can you, see Can you guys hear us? Yes, go ahead. Great. So I'm actually still in school. I'm actually going to school for paleontology, of all things, which is dinosaurs and other stuff. But a lot of people get a degree, a bachelor's degree in biology. I don't know your background. Um, I have a bachelor's in conservation of environmental science and then a minor in biological sciences. So there's a wide variety of things you can do. Uh, usually in a zoo, you're going to be looking at either a biology degree, conservation science, psychology. psychology is another one, depending on what you go into. Uh, we have a couple people who work in veterinary medicine. I forget, ecology is another one that's very, very important. And we do have a lot of our zookeepers specifically went to school for animal behavior. Yeah. And then you also, a lot of it has to do with experience. Mm -hmm. So any kind of experience you can get either volunteering at places that have animals, whether it be an animal shelter um, or even doing dog walking, those types of things. Volunteering at a zoo, if you, there's a volunteer program near you, going to zoo camps mm -hmm. um, and those different things. That's all good experience that you can get as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Mrs. Stantine's class, did you have a question? Um, where, where did you get so, snakes are, what's an omnivore? An omnivore, that's a pretty big word. So those of you guys that are a little bit younger might not have heard that word in school yet. Basically, it's a big word that describes says that an animal eats both plants and so people like us are omnivores. We eat everything. Most people, well, <laughs> some people are vegetarian by choice, but we are all omnivores traditionally. Great. Well, we have another, it looks like we have another 10 minutes or so. Um, so let's, let's start again with the first uh, class to see if you have another question. Miss um, um, Edwards class, did you have a, another question for the team here? Yes, go ahead, Alex. Um, do you have any Komodo dragons? Oh, Komodo dragons? We do not, unfortunately, have Komodo dragons here, so that would be real cool. They do have them at the Virginia Aquarium, though. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Um, and then what about uh, Mrs. Reading's class? Do you guys have another question? Yes, we do. We do have a question. Go ahead. How long does it take for a snake to shed its skin? That's a great question. So it depends on how big the snake is. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on how long the snake is as well. So like a snake like Lernin, who we met, he can sometimes take about a week to a week and a half to shed his skin, um, where we do have some smaller gray rat snakes. Um, some people also have black rat snakes in their area. It's kind of the same type of snake. They look pretty similar. Um, they usually shed within about four days or so. So they're actually more um, fast. Mm -hmm. The smaller a snake is, the quicker they usually shed. And then those big, huge snakes, like the reticulated pythons or the Burmese pythons, that can take anywhere from two to three weeks to shed sometimes. Wonderful. And Mrs. Patterson, did you did your class have another question? Yes, we do. <laughs> so if a snake eats a rat that's diseased, would they get the disease? What a great question. So here's the thing. <laughs> Oh goodness, snakes are reptiles and rats are mammals. And usually, usually, the diseases that affect a mammal are not going to make a reptile sick. That's not to say that there's not diseases that can affect both, but because they're so different, a lot of times diseases are very, very specialized in what kind of animal they can infect. So there are things called zoonotic diseases, which means it can go from different species all over the place. And at that point, we would be more worried about us getting sick than a snake getting sick. Um, but usually, that's not a concern. But that was a really, really great question. Wonderful. Uh, Mrs. DeShane's class, did you have another question? Go ahead. Um, how, how old do some of your um, animals get? I'll let you answer that. <laughs> um, I was looking to see who we all have. We got it. Um, some of our shed since 2009. So easy, 99. 1999. Or 1999. Yeah. Learn it was here since 1999. So that somebody do math for me. That makes him 20. Uh, 19. 19. Yep. Um, so those big boas can actually live closer to being like 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So they can live a long time. Um, our pancake tortoises typically can live 20 to 30 years. Um, I'm not 100% sure how old our pancake was because his, oh, his number is not on there. Um, our legless lizard that you met is actually pretty young. They're going to get a lot larger in size. So those legless lizards are probably only about three years old right now. Um, and they'll actually live to be about 15 years old. And then our tegu, 2009. she's been here since 2009. So she's nine years old. Mm -hmm. And they'll probably live about 30 years, 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mrs. Sal Saldivar's class, did you have another question? He came here first. If he doesn't have yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. A lizard that looks like a snake, can it swim? I don't think so. That's a great question. Yeah. They tend to live in very dry climates, so very dry areas um, anyway. So the answer to your question is they probably would not need to swim, but because they can move really fast like a snake, mm -hmm. if they needed to get across a little bit of water, they can kind of go across the yeah. water really fast. Yes. Cool. And Mrs. Stantine's class, did you have another question? Oh, great. <laughs> Why snakes live in your garden? Why do what they do? So they live in your garden because you're, they were there. For your garden. There we go. Go ahead. All of those questions. <laughs> Uh, so snakes live in your garden probably because they were already there before we made our garden. So one thing we like to talk about is learning how to live with animals. Like I said before, they do live in your backyard. You're going to see them all over the place. And they're there probably because they're 
keeping all those mice and those rats and other small mammals that are running around in your backyard. So that's their job. That's what they're doing is eating up all of those rodents that might otherwise be taking over the world. Anything to add? And your garden probably also has lots of kind of brush or things that they can hide under. Mm -hmm. So there's probably lots of plants that they can hide behind or if the grass is tall in that area. Those are all things they can hide under so that other things can't see them. So that helps them to camouflage or to hide in their environment. So we just have a couple more minutes, so we'll 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 take maybe one or two more questions. So let's start again at uh, Mrs. Edwards' class. If you guys have another question, feel free to come up. Okay, go ahead. Um, how do you get rid of a rattlesnake? Can you say that one more time? I don't think we quite caught it. How do you get rid of a rattlesnake? Oh. Well, so that's kind of a, a, an interesting question because sometimes you do find snakes in your house. So the best thing to do in that situation, because remember, that rattlesnake is not like our rat snakes. That rattlesnake is probably venomous, and venomous means that if they bite you, that they could make you really sick. So the best thing to do in that situation is to call your local animal services in your town. You can usually find their phone number on a police dispatch website. If you call them, they can come out and they can relocate that snake to someplace that's a little more appropriate for it. Because it does still have an important job, it might have just taken a wrong turn at Albuquerque and ended up in your house. And it might not realize that it's someplace that it's not supposed to be. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Reedens' class, did you have another question? Yeah, we have one more. How many snake species do you have in the zoo? Beautiful. Ooh, so many. Um, so we actually just opened up a brand new world reptile building that's got an entire gallery of venomous snakes. So I am afraid, I don't think I can give you an exact number because we just opened that and I haven't spent a lot of time in there. But in our department, just in the education department, we've got, hold on. Cognos. Gray Boa. rats, boa, queen. Burmese python. Ball python. About six. Six different species. Six different species. And then within that, we've got multiples in a couple of those. So we've got three um, ball pythons, two common boas like learning, two Hog giant hognose snakes, two gray rat snakes, one rhino rat snake, a sand boa. Oh, I forgot sand boas. So seven species, actually. Burmese python. And a Burmese python. So we've got several different snakes that we work with. Thank you. Wonderful. Mrs. Patterson's class, did you have another quick question? Yes, we do. Um, how does the rattlesnake's tail make the rattling sound? We don't work with rattlesnakes here. Do you know, Emily? Yeah. Hang on. The guest speaker. <laughs> I don't know how tall I am compared. So my name is Emily. Um, I work in the education department too. Rattlesnakes shed their skin, and as they shed their skin over time, that shed skin goes to the back of our bottom of their tail, and they just move their tail um, to make that rattling noise. But you can't tell how old a rattlesnake is based off of the amount of rattles on its tail or how many parts there are to the um, rattle on its tail because they can break off. Um, so it's something that they just grow, it grows as they shed their skin over time. That's so cool. So yeah, you learn something new every day. Yeah, we learn something new today. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, um, Mrs. Duchesne's class, do you have a quick question? Yeah. <laughs> can you train any animals to do tricks? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we train some of our animals, like our snakes, we don't really train them to do different behaviors. Um, their training is mostly like you saw them, we were holding them. So their training is really just, they learn how to get picked up out of their enclosure, to be put down on something and then to be held and for people to touch them. Other animals, so like our mammals and birds, we can train them lots of different things. So we can train different animals to spin in a circle. You can train them um to sit still, sit still <laughs> to come up on your hand like our birds can come out on our hands um you can train them to go pick stuff up um mm -hmm. so almost any animal can be trained it just is 
depending on what the behavior you want is. So like you can't ask um, a bird to climb a tree because they can't climb a tree, but you could ask them to jump onto different branches. So you just have to see what your animal is actually able to do. And then the biggest thing is that we use positive reinforcement for our training. So like when we have our mammals and our birds that we work with, uh, every time they do something good, they get a treat for it. So they learn that when I do this, I get a treat. And if they do something that was not what we asked for, we just ignore it and wait for them to do the right thing. That we mm-hmm. want. So then they get a treat. And some animals like our chickens learn really, really quickly because they love mealworms. And every time they do what we ask, they get a mealworm. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. And then um, Mrs. Stantine's class, do you have a quick question? Go ahead. Go ahead again. How does snake eat? So snakes, they can eat a lot of different things. Mostly they're going to be eating small warm things like small birds or mice. But there are some snakes that eat. Some snakes, like king snakes, even eat other snakes, which is kind of crazy. There are some snakes that will eat bugs, although there's not very many of them. Maybe but when they're little bitty, but most snakes are only going to eat some kind of meat, including eggs. Um, there's not really any snakes that eat a lot of vegetables or fruit. Great. And we hopefully have one last question from, from Mrs. Saldivar's class. Okay. Here's one more. Great. What does the venom look like? The venom look like? So it's it's like a clear liquid, but you don't usually, sometimes it's got kind of a yellowish color to it. Again, I've never been bitten by a venomous snake, so I can't speak from firsthand experience, but if you've ever seen someone milking a snake, basically that means they take a venomous snake and they put their teeth in a jar and then that venom drips out so they can make an antidote for it or a medicine for it. It's usually like a clearish kind of yellow, mucusy colored, like colored in like milk. Yeah, kind of. So it looks kind of gross, honestly. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jess and Stephanie, and also Emily for answering questions and showing us these amazing reptiles uh, from the Virginia Zoo. And I think everyone here should give a big thank you to the team. The mics are all on now. That's awesome. So this has been another uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We've had classrooms from all the way around North America, from Quebec, San Antonio, Connecticut. Um, We have some from California, New Jersey. Um, and even Virginia as well. So this has been a real pleasure. And thank you for, uh, for sharing with us your amazing animals. No problem. Thank Bye. You guys. Take care. Bye-bye.